Welcome everyone. My name is David Stevens. I'm the Industrial Applications Manager for Trotec Laser. And we have an exciting webinar today uh, titled Wood, uh, Laser Processing Woods. Um, this is a webinar that is going to teach you and, and, and go through every process and technique and capability, or I should say most top techniques and capabilities of processing wood with your laser engraving system. Um, we'll be joined by Keith o Odin, uh, afterwards, uh, which is the head of Sawmill Creek to help answer some questions. And then we'll, we'll get right into uh, a answering any questions. If you do have any questions during this webinar, please feel free to post them as that a question arises. And then at the end of the course, we will go through and answer those questions live. Then, uh, uh, or if for some reason you can't uh, stay the entire length to, to hear those questions answered, this course will also be streamed on YouTube and recorded so that you can watch it at a later date. So let's go ahead and switch to my screen here, and then we'll get going on to this webinar today. So this webinar is called Laser Processing Wood, and it is the uh, the overview of kind of understanding how what works with the laser system, what kind of materials work with the laser systems when it comes to wood, different customer uh, uh, or uh, custom applications and stuff like that. So we're going to get started with a quick video to kind of show you the process. Okay, that kind of gives you a kind of an idea of all the different types of applications that you can do with wood. Um, this app, th this seminar is actually has a many different QR codes, and so if um, if for some reason you have questions when it comes to uh, running the uh, or, or finding the different locations and stuff like that, you can open up your phone, open up the camera app, and you don't have to take an actual photograph. All you have to do is point your camera at the at the actual QR code and it'll take you to these different type of uh, links, uh, to websites, to images, to files, and basically content and digital creation stuff that you can have access to. So keep your phone handy or uh, rewatch this and scan this at a later date if you wanna go to these links. Trotec USA is a very social company. If you want to keep up with any of these types of seminars, new products, applications, materials, uh, you can definitely follow us on any of your favorite social media platforms. We are active and live on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and Twitter. So an outline of today's webinar is laser technology and com that is compatible with woodworking, choosing the right types of wood, cutting and engraving wood, laser limitation to processing wood, advanced applications. Then we're gonna go into some Trotec updates. And then we're gonna finish with a Q and A with, Ke uh, with Keith Outen, the owner of Sawmill Creek Woodworkers Forum. Introduction today is la laser engraving wood offers a freedom to create precise and personalized custom made materials, which adds value to any business. Make your products unique by engraving images, names, or even logos into your materials. Laser cutting provides perfect 
precision cutting a custom fit parts within a tenth of a millimeter, even with small or fine shapes. Compared to other technology, laser systems save times and can accommodate even the thinnest materials with its non-contact processing. Applications that can be processed with the laser system seem to be endless in my opinion, but here are a few of some of the more common, including architectural models, toys, furniture, cabinets, which is also inlay, photo engraving, signage, decor, gifts, and jewelry, arts and crafts, and shop fitting, as well as pretty much anything you can do with wood processing, uh, or working with wood can typically be done with a laser system. Now, we're gonna go through here and kind of uh, walk through a little bit on laser technology. Laser technology is the process or the, the technology that Trotec makes that actually processes it. And so we're gonna, or that actually works with the wood itself. And I'm gonna kind of show you some of the different laser systems that are commonly used with wood. Um, and then some of the accessories that we would recommend that you would use or purchase with a laser system should you wanna use a laser system to process wood. Trotec has a clear advantage. Personal customization options share an important focus for those who process woods. And a Trotec laser is suited for a variety of woods um, with the option to quickly create any look and, and desired. And so here, here's kind of an example of a two inch by eight inch by 12 inch solid basswood piece that had an engraving directly into it. The advantages of a Trotec is a to process beautiful wood designs using any CO2 laser system. Um, simple digital manufacturing, no time consuming programming compared to milling. Uh, lasers are ideal for uh, ideal beam performance and optics. No tool wear when, with laser processing um, and uh, wear and tear on critical components. There's no shavings or dust or debris that tends to come from more mechanical means of actually processing wood. And unlike other technologies, laser processing wood evaporates any excess waste waste so there's no shavings are produced it's basically only producing smoke so here's a simple little video that actually has uh showcases the 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 unbelievable detail and precision of a laser system so you can see here just the smoke is the byproduct and the laser is able to cut precision laser cut uh, clip in this case is just an example of, of the precision and accuracy of a laser system and how it can actually cut out on a simple piece of wood here. And so this is an MDF core with a uh, maple veneer face and the laser is cutting through it with ease. And this is at full speed. Um, there's, this is not a time lapse. And so that, that was the actual time. After you're done, you can simply just wipe off this surface and then you can see the accuracy and precision by placing the actual part together. And so this is a great example video that really shows you how accurate a laser system can be with no dust, debris, uh, or any other setup times, basically just taking a drawing from your design software and then placing it onto the laser system using presets and then uh, cutting that out. And on the same piece of wood, I'm able to snap this component together just to showcase the ability and accuracy of a laser system and how I can quickly and easily create unbelievable accuracy and precision on just a simple product and, and as you can see you could probably you can you could transport this type of process onto all different types of applications and that accuracy is held consistent among all different types of woods and materials when processing with a laser system Now the Trotec Speedy series is our most common and the most common used with the wood industries, whether you're a beginner or a seasoned veteran, um, you, uh, it's easy to use a laser, uh, speedy laser system to help grow your business. Um, maximum processing speeds up to 170 inches per second. What that means is the engraving speed. So the head actually moves back and forth at 170 inches per second. Um, patented low maintenance design encloses uh, critical components in its rugged housing, protecting it from dust and dirt low maintenance requirements, less downtime, and it, it minim the, what this means is that it minimizes all uh, overall ownership and cost. Um, the Speedy series comes in four different models, the Speedy 100, which is 12 by 24, the Speedy 300, which is 29 by 17 inches, and that's the engraving area, Speedy 360, which is 32 by 20 inches, and our Speedy 400, which is 40 inches by 24 inches. 
On top of the Speedy series, we have our large format laser systems. Large format systems have generous working areas. The SP series is a of laser cutties are ideal for standard large format materials um, with field sizes that can go as large as 128 by 128 inches. As you can see over here on our SP 4000, 3000, 2000, we have our 1500 and our 500. Um, these are ideal from small to very large projects. Great for mass production, um, the ability to cut thick materials, um, excellent for furniture and decor type applications, but can be used for small applications. And this large machine, though it may be much larger than the small Speedy series, is just as simple to operate. If you can operate a Speedy 100 or a Speedy 300 machine, the, the operational aspect is very similar. The software is very similar. And so the transition from one to the other is, a, is an easy process. Here's a video of the of the Speedy uh, three, or, or I'm sorry, the SP two thousand actually cutting one inch thick birch wood. So you can see here on the actual very very thick notched birch wood is actually cutting together, um, and this is actually doing an actual tabletop uh, for a uh, barbecue system. So a much, much more power because this system can go up to 400 watts of laser power. So it allows for wood cutting in materials and thickness cutting that cannot be done on the smaller system. And that's really the difference, not only size on the larger system, but uh, also the ability with much higher laser wattage, we can cut through much thicker materials as well because of the increased wattage capability. Now, no matter what laser system you're using, um, there are different table options and accessories that we would recommend for processing these materials, especially wood. Um, and though Trotec has lots of different cutting grids and different tables, there are a couple that we do highly recommend if you're doing a lot of wood cutting. Um, and that is the aluminum cutting grid table, um, which is uh, gen for general cutting tasks, large parts, small parts, um, less than 100, 100 millimeters, uh, maximum support compared to aluminum. Uh, uh, aluminum slat cutting table. The aluminum slat cutting table, when you want less surface area, um, the aluminum slats are nice because you can actually remove them and so that the laser excess power is not is passed through it. And it just gives you a cleaner background part, especially when you're cutting thicker materials. Um, the individual lamules can be individually placed in on the cutting grid. And the nice thing about the, the Trotec Speedy series is that a lot of these, these tables can be inter interchanged. And so depending on which model you have will allow you to interchange the different tables for different capabilities depending on what type of application or material you're processing. Now, when it comes to engraving woods, which is the course that we're discussing today, um, the lever of detail, the graphic goes up. There's different lens choices that are uh, available on the systems. Trotex make all different types of lenses. Um, and the rule of thumb is 1.5 or two inch lens are suitable for almost any laser on wood. If you're just engraving it, your standard one and a half or two, um, I would honestly personally recommend the two inch lens for most suitable wood processing for engraving and cutting. Um, a, up to a specific thickness, which we'll get into here in a second. Um, for cutting wood, uh, if you're going up to about a half of an inch, I would recommend the two inch lens. Some people do also like the two and a half inch lens from a quarter to a half. I personally like the two inch lens up to about a half of an inch of thickness. Um, if you're going thicker than that, I would go to the two and a half inch lens because lenses are kind of like a magnifying glass. Um, yeah, the divergence as you go in and out of focus, the beam becomes wider. Um, and that wide wideness as it goes in and out of focus can actually cause slight angle to be uh, to basically uh, be uh, translated into your wood material or your material that you're cutting through. So the thicker you go through, different lenses will give you a straighter cut. The drawback is as you go to a longer lens, your beam diameter becomes larger and it takes more power to cut. And so you don't wanna to go too long to get a straighter cut because it takes a lot more laser power. Um, Trotec can go as long as a four inch lens on the CO2, um, which is ideal for cutting foams and stuff, but I do not recommend that for cutting thick woods due to the fact that the beam diameter is three times larger than the two inch lens. And so it just takes that much more power to cut through, unless you're using our large format laser systems. 
Now, beyond the types of machines, um, and if you already have a laser system, the next comes down to really understanding wood and how to choose the right type of wood, how to choose the um, processing types of woods itself. So the wood itself is kind of important. And the reason it's important is because there is a lot of types of woods out there. Um, here's just a, a, here's a list of the most common woods. And so this can, can be a little overwhelming. Um, and the fact that when I went to Wikipedia and typed in types of woods and got this list, my jaw even dropped. And can because I've dealt with all different types of woods over the years, but there are so many different species. There's so many different types. How do you know what's going to work best with the laser system? How do you know which is the, 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 best system for for processing with your with your laser system uh oh looks like my my screen got changed here hold on one second Apologize for that. So we're going to kind of go through and explain the different abilities on the material itself, um, the different types of wood. And it kind of doesn't really matter what type of wood it is. There's never been a wood that I have not been able to process with the wood. Um, the, it comes down to different characteristics of the wood itself. Um, hardwoods and softwoods. Hardwoods tend to be heavily heavy, more costly, darker colors. Um, they're naturally water resistant. Um, they, uh, they, they tend to last several decades. They have a, uh, but they also have a high environmental impact because they, they, they're much older and longer time, time to actually grow. Softwood is lighter weight, tends to be inexpensive. Um, and the light color, they tend to produce a lighter color. Um, and they need to be treated for weather resistance. And they, the, the drawback is they don't last as long, um, but they do also have a less environmental impact. Um, so processing different woods and understanding the different hardness and softness can make a big difference. And so we're going to go through and kind of explain what the difference are and how, how to handle each of these different characteristics when it comes to processing woods with a laser system. So for just standard engraving wood, it uh, really doesn't matter the type of wood. Uh, engraving wood can add detail and dimension for a variety of applications, and different types of wood can produce different contrast engraving results. Um, wood has a high perceived value, uh, and it typically produces unique products. Um, custom fit parts within a tenth of a millimeter, even with small or fine shapes. Um, you can save time and accommodate even the thinnest materials with non-contact processing with the laser. Um, you can also cut the wood. You know, laser cutting, it is uh, often considered highly desirable. Um, I do recommend a cutting grid table, uh, accurate focusing, um, customized selections of the, uh, the, the correct parameters, uh, and using the, the right optics for processing it, as well as air assist. Air assist is a material itself that is, or, or a uh, option or accessory itself that is recommended when cutting woods themselves. Um, laser processing wood, you get a dark cutting edge. Um, it's a brownish or whitish colored engravings can serve as an exceptional design elements in wood products. And so you get that, that contrast when the, the laser actually goes into the wood, you're cutting with pure heat. And so the contrast that is actually achieved when engraving wood is caused by the heat actually burning the wood itself, causing that, that darking effect. Um, there is little to, to no time consuming cleaning afterwards, um, besides just a simple wipe, which we'll cover later. Um, and un unlike other technology, engraving can be achieved in a matter of seconds. Now, kind of going back to the different species of woods, when you're engraving wood, the contrast and the quality is going to actually change based on the species and the type uh, of the wood itself. And so as you change in color of wood, don't assume all wood is going to be the best for all types of applications. And so here's a great example of different spectrums of contrast. And so I have a maple wood, a cherry wood, a walnut wood and an ebony wood, which is great because it um, it kind of shows you the spectrum of contrast that you get when you laser process or engrave into those woods. And as the lighter the wood is, the better that contrast is. And as we get into those middle tones, like your cherry and your walnut and your birch and your plies, and there's so many different types in there, the lighter that color of the wood, assume the laser is always going to darken it. Now, 
uh, you know, that's not saying something like ebony wood doesn't have its, its own appeal. It does look good. But if I were to do something like a photograph on it, the contrast is going to be much, much lower than, say, maple wood or cherry wood. So that is really the difference of understanding the, the, the type of wood itself and understanding the different contrast within those woods. The other big thing when it comes to engraving is understanding grain. Grain is a big problem when it comes to lasering because unlike CNC and milling and machining and using mechanical tools, which etch into it at a specific level, the laser is one continuous amount of heat. And so as it engraves into different densities, which is wood grain, the lighter densities are going to produce a deeper effect. And the, and the heavier densities are going to produce less depth. And so what that produces is a lot of streaking and patterning onto some woods. And so here's a good example of uh, oak versus walnut side by side. Walnut is a very tight grain material, um, similar to cherry, birch, maple, as well as most of your hard, hardwoods tend to be very tight grain. Um, uh, where oak, even though it is considered a hardwood, also has a lot of grain pattern in it. Now, it doesn't look bad. Uh, if you're doing a lot of text and logos and black and whites, it's just going to it's going to be just fine. The problem really comes into is on the next slide here when you're engraving materials like photographs. And so here is a, an example of the grain pattern on a simple piece of pine and oak versus a piece of maple and cherry. And so you can see the difference here. The grain pattern can really distract the eye when it comes to actually engraving a photograph. And so I've got this tiger on a piece of pine versus a piece of cherry. Um, and you can really see those lines going through it. Even though the power setting was good, um, there's really nothing you can do to fix that. And so just the goal is to kind of understanding the reaction to the wood on the laser system. So as you're engraving it, when you understand the species and the reaction, you understand that yeah, I may be able to engrave just logos and graphics and black and whites on certain woods um, and say, stay away from spruce, oak, bamboo, pine. And you'll find many others as well that tend to have a lot of grain patterns. And then stick with the known good types of woods like cherry, walnut, maple, birch, um, as well as many, many others. Most of your, your hardwoods can produce a... Um, a great photograph. And again, but if you want the contrast, you do need to stick with the lighter color ones like the maple and the cherry. So hardwood versus softwood density is really kind of another one here. And so as we go into the different species of woods, besides grain, there are also kind of understanding the, the overall hardness and softness of the material. And this is a important when it comes to lasering because not only does it affect your power settings, um, but also the, the power settings for both engraving and for cutting um, it, it, uh, because of the density of the material. So when someone comes to me and says, hey, can we, can we cut this wood? My first question to them is what, what is the species? And the reason is, is because of this right here. And if it is too thick, and the density is too hard, then I'm gonna have a difficult time cutting that type of wood. And so when it comes to understanding the different woods, never assume that you're gonna be able to cut through any thickness until you understand that type of wood. And so here's kind of a small scale factor of what woods and the different density variations on it, um, different thicknesses. And, and I have a, a, a kind of an, a few examples here to kind of show you what I mean. As we go into softer woods like balsa and cork and basswood, and then we go into pine, spruce, oak, cherry, walnut, maple, and then we get into the really hard ones, which are uh, ironwood and ebony. These woods that are more hard or, or, or much harder in density require far more laser power. And that's why this is important. So as we go into the softer woods, I can cut through faster. I can cut through thicker. And that is the difference. So the wattage of laser that you have versus the density of the wood will determine whether or not you can engrave and how deep you can engrave at, at what speed, as well as how thick you can cut and how fast you can cut. So besides understanding the contrast and the density of the wood, it's, it's also understanding the hardness of the wood so that you can, you, can, you can get a determination on how thick you can cut when it comes to the species. So here's an example. What I have done is I've taken three different woods and I've done it side by side here. And I'm going to play a little video. So the first one here is balsa wood. Balsa wood is the probably the softest wood on the planet. And you can see here when I push play here, it will happen quickly. 
That was a full speed cut. 0.8 seconds, I'm able to cut a one inch by one inch square. So it's incredible how fast I can cut something because of the density. As I go up in grain density and hardness, which is cherry here, if I hit play on this one, it took two seconds to cut out the piece of cherry wood of the same thickness. So that same thickness of material side by side with the same wattage. And then the last one here, I had some piece of ebony. Ebony, in my opinion, there are woods that are considered harder grain, but this is the hardest wood. I've actually got a hold of some of the hardest woods on the planet, and it is faster than cutting ebony. For some reason, the darkness seems to affect the laser itself. So ebony is one of the hardest woods to cut in general when it comes to laser processing. So here's an eighth inch piece of ebony on 120 watt, and it takes five full seconds to cut what I did in 0.8 seconds when processing or cutting the same thickness of balsa wood. So this really kind of illustrates what I'm talking about. And this holds true for engraving as well. So if I'm engraving into something like balsa wood, I'm gonna be able to do it five, five times faster and get the same amount of depth as I am into ebony wood. And that holds true also with cherry wood as well, because that density will determine how fast the reaction into the material. So if I need to get a specific depth of engraving, I'm gonna be able to do that much faster on something like balsa wood. And then it's gonna take a little more time for cherry wood. And then again, for ebony, same with cutting. So understanding this, understanding how much laser power you have and the type of species of wood, as well as contrast, will determine the, the final setting. Now, beyond standard woods comes an, another twist to the wood industry, and that is composites and engineered woods. Engineered woods uh, are, are, will basically will contain the same woods and used in uh, lumber, but they're manufactured with other materials for durability. Uh, combinations of woods and plastics and straw and, and are typically bound together with heat and, and adhesive. Um, and they're coated with veneers a lot of times. The benefits is they're inexpensive. They're typically weather resistant. Um, when painted or sealed, um, but they also may contain harmful chemicals. Some of the more common ones used on the laser industry are plywoods, MDF, veneered MDF, as well as a, a new one that we've been working with is Trocraft Eco. Eco. Um, we recommend using all air assist and stuff when processing. This doesn't mean that these materials won't work. They're actually great for the laser system, <clears throat> but there are a few issues when it comes to actually processing the materials like this. Plywood is uh, a very, very common material, and I'm going to kind of go through the three, the, the, the different types here. Um, plywood is, can be tricky um, because if it's a laser-ready plywood, which is why I have a QR code here, so you can scan and order laser-ready plywood. There are a lot of plywoods out there, and not all plywood is created equal. It is a highly durable material, and it's great for the laser, but if you buy it from you know, some woodworking shop, you may not know what's inside. And the, what I mean by inside is plywood is created by basically taking laminated veneers of a specific thickness, and then they're, they're rotated 90 degrees and they're cross-grained and glued together with pressure and heat. What happens is they tend to use the low quality woods and resins inside those plies. So the inside plies, which no one's gonna typically see, are on the inside of that wood, which is fine. But the problem lies with lasers is that inside core can actually, if it, it has a lot of knots and extra resins and glues inside that, that can, can interfere with the laser beam. So if you go down to your local hardware store and pick up a piece of plywood and it starts cutting just fine, and then all of a sudden you'll have areas of the plywood that do not cut through. This is because the laser hits a different density pocket um, or glue seam on the inside of those plies. And so you wanna stick with laser ready plies or a brand that you know has very consistent results. Um, and that's the problem with plywood. It is extremely durable. It works great. Um, you know, it looks great, but when it comes to cutting it, you are going to have a high failure rate uh, if you don't have a consistent source for this material. And so here is a source for you if you want. Um, if you use your own source, just make sure you test it prior to actually processing that material. Now, MDF is probably my favorite. The reason I really like MDF, MDF is medium density fiberboard. Basically, it's uh, ground sawdust that's been compressed together with resin or glue. Um, and the reason I like this is because unlike plywood, it is very consistent. 
And that's what we like with the laser system. Consistency is um, there's no core issues because the material is basically, this is basically, MDF is basically thick paper. So it's pulp that's been compressed together. Um, um, it's much larger pulp than paper, but basically it's, that's what it is. It's very, very thick paper. Um, it's extremely durable, uh, um, just like plywood, but it does produce consistent cutting. Um, the, 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 so there's no core issues like the plywood. Um, the drawback of it is that it does have poor engraving contrast. Um, and you got to be careful again where you get it. Not all MD MDF is laser friendly. Some brands that I have come across have um, been used much higher pressure or they use a, a type of glue resin that it produces a much harder response. And so when I go to cut a piece of eighth or quarter inch MDF, all of a sudden it doesn't cut through. So you want to make sure you stick with brands. And again, here's a couple different brands, uh, a QR code you can scan here to show if that that is laser ready. Um, when you do find that it is laser ready, it is very consistent. It cuts very consistent, um, but it's not good for engraving. It's great for structural type stuff. And that's why a lot of MDF has actually gone to the next level, which is the veneered faced MDF. This is kind of the best of both worlds because um, you can see these little boxes here. It looks like bamboo. It looks like cherry. It looks like maple, but it has a real veneer on the surfaces on the, on the front and the back surface of the MDF. Um, and this is great because now you have the durability of plywood, um, you have the consistency of MDF, but you have the look of the real wood. And so, uh, in my opinion, it is the most consistent and the best material, especially on the thin side, to work with the laser. You're not going to have cracking problems, seam problems, bonding problems. When you're doing like the flexible hinges, like you see here, which we'll cover a little bit later, um, you're not going to have them dry out over time and crack because that inside core is made of MDF. So understanding different types of woods like this beyond your, your real woods, the MDF, in my opinion, is the best when it comes to working with this type. Secondly, it would be plywood as long as it is a laser-ready plywood. Another one that we've been working with and Trotec now sells called Trocraft Eco. This is a great new material. It's a lot like MDF, but it is a little bit different. It's made from pure cellulose fiber uh, produced without additives. It's fully biodegradable. Um, it's also emission free. It's lightweight, easy to process and ideal for modeling, making indoor designs. And the nice thing about it is it's got a real cool pattern on it. It's extremely strong. But on the flip side is it cuts excessively fast with the laser. So you get the strength length with speed. Um, it's great for your architectural modeling, your designs, your back structures. Um, it, it's, it, and it is just a great material to work with. Um, if you want to scan this QR code, you can take a look at it. Um, but it is a wood-like material that is, uh, it's just an alternative to like that, uh, the MDF. But you can also get it in much thinner because it is so strong. You can get it in much, much thinner sheets of material and then still have the, that incredible durability and look of wood. So what kind of materials to work with? That's what it comes down. We've covered all the different types of woods. I just gave you a list of 320 common woods, um, solid woods, MDF woods, veneers, plywoods, exotic woods. There are so many different choices out there. Um, and it really depends on what kind of application you're working with. Um, there's no wrong answer. Just keep in mind the limitations that we have just covered. Um, is there gonna be too much grain and I wanna do a photograph? Is it too dark? Do I need contrast? Um, is it too thin and is it gonna crack if I get too much detail? Do I need something like an MDF? And that's really understanding the different diversities of the different woods and all the different products out there of how to pick the correct material and when to pick the correct material. Now, after you process the material, there are a few other things that I want to cover here today. Um, and one is really understanding how to kind of clean up afterwards the material itself. Uh, when you engrave wood, because we are burning it, we're going to get a little bit of smoke, haze, and residue. Um, I do recommend clear coating, or paint coating, polyurethane, varnishing woods itself protect the smart surface from the smoke residue. And we're gonna go through a couple different methods here um, of, of actually cleaning the woods out itself. Um, coating the wood is my recommendation. So if the wood is finished with a lacquer, an oil base, a varnish or polyurethane, what this does is it actually protects the wood pores from the staining from the lasering process. And 
it is ideal because after the wood has been cleaned, polished, sanded, uh, smooth, and then and then coated with one of these coatings, it makes it much easier to laser process. And so you want, if possible, to completely finish the wood before laser processing. Um, or if you order the wood or you buy it already, so the, a lot of the laser woods and stuff that I have been showcasing with the QR codes are already finished with these surface coatings. The reason is, is when you're finished, you can just quickly take that stain off with either a damp cloth um, or others. And so here's a couple other videos of just cleaning the woods themselves. And so if it's got a coating on it, you take a damp cloth over the surface and it just wipes right off. If this is raw wood, that stain and smoke and debris is going to literally just uh, stay on there and it's just going to smear when it comes to that. And so if it is finished, you get that clean effect. If you do produce too much heat into the laser and require a little bit more. So sometimes when I'm doing like the bend hinges and stuff like that, even a, a simple cloth is not quite enough. And so a magic eraser sponge, which actually has a small amount of pumice is nice because what it does is because of that amount of pumice, even though the wood in this case is clear coated, you can see the living hinge that I have here still has little, little, little stains and stuff like that, that don't come off with a common rag. If you take a magic eraser, it will take that next layer off and kind of give you that next level of quality onto the wood. And so if you engrave a little too deep or if you're cutting lots of detail and you still get a little staining that doesn't wipe off the clear coat, take a magic eraser to it. It's a great little laser hack that I have covered in the past that really showcases the ability to just take that next level off without going into some of these next steps. And the next step is masking. Masking is a pain, um, but if you have a raw wood, so in this case, this is a raw, piece of uh, uh, plywood that has no clear decoding on it. So what I have done is I've masked it and I'm engraving it with extra power here and to kind of show you the case of how to mask wood. And so you can see here the amount of residue that's on the surface of the material would just wipe off. It would not wipe off, I should say, with a damp cloth. And so if I engrave through it, with a mask on it, how do I get all those little pieces of mask? And so here's a great little tick, uh, tip to actually remove some of these masks, and that is common duct tape. Duct tape is nice. And so say you're engraving cutting boards where you can't use a polyurethane and you got an intricate logo you're doing on it, but you need to peel the mask off without picking every piece off. This is a great little laser hack that allows you to just quickly drop over the top of that logo on that cutting board. Maybe it's a bamboo cutting board, take the piece of duct tape and then peel that mask off so you have that finished result. And you can see the difference here with a non-masked piece of wood. Um, even if I wiped it, it would never look much better than that. Um, and in small details and stuff like that, you can't really sand because when you go to sand it, uh, afterwards, you're going to break all those little details off. And that's the problem. Some people are like, well, I'll just sand that off. Well, and that's great. And sanding does work. Um, and that's, matter of fact, that is the next one. So on larger graphics, you can get away with sanding. So if you have unfinished woods that you want to do an engraving on, so here's an engraving on a much larger surface area with not too much detail. I um, mean, that's the key. The too much detail, small little intricate details, the sander is going to break when you go to actually sand it. But if you have larger panels and stuff, yes, you can go to the next step and use a standard sander with like a 150 to 220 uh, sandpaper onto it. And then just go over it, keeping the sander very flat. If you go at an angle, you can really mess up your piece. So keep it very flat, very consistent so that you now have that finished result. Again, not too much detail because that sander will break all those little bits off. And so this is a large 12 by 12 engraving. Uh, so if you're doing uh, counters or, or, or like uh, front of cabinetry and stuff like that, um, and you don't have it finished first and you want to sand it afterwards, you can get away with that. And so that is a, a couple different ways using just a standard cloth on your, your, your coated woods. Um, if it's a little bit stubborn using a magic eraser, um, and then, you know, if you're doing like something like a highly detailed cutting board where you can't lacquer it or coat it because it's going to be used for food, for example, um, then the duct tape works great to take the mask. So you mask it, squeegee the mask down, engrave through it with the detail, take your duct tape and peel up that mask. And then lastly, of course, sanding it down after you're done engraving it onto this piece of plywood, which works just fine in these cases as well, as long as it's a flat piece of material um, and the detail is not too great. So now I'm going to go through a few applications. Wood applications are um, some of the more specific, unique applications kind of uh, suited for laser processing. Um, and the first one here is a processing inlay. Inlay is ideal. You take a piece of veneer and a piece of solid wood, 
or it could be an MDF or whatever you wanna inlay. And then you take a digital vectorized graphic. So here's a good example of a standard inlay. You just engrave into the surface of the material. You do wanna measure the thickness of your veneer and do a little test uh, to make sure you're engraving to the right thickness or depth. A little bit of trial and error is recommended so you get the engraving settings just right. Then you take your graphic the digital graphic itself, and this is why it has to be vectorized because you're gonna convert it from a black and then you're gonna fade it and you're gonna, gonna convert it to an actual red outline from, a, from an engraving to a cut line. You don't need to compensate for the kerf because the beam diameter is small enough, it, it fills it up very nicely. And then go ahead and stick your veneer onto your cutting grid and then cut it out. And so once the veneer is cut out to the same thickness, and so what I'll do is I'll usually measure the thickness of the veneer and then that will determine how much power I put into the engraving. And then I'm going to go ahead and just do what I would typically do when doing inlay. The nice thing about this is there's no better tool for doing inlay. A little bit of glue, engrave the pocket, cut the veneer, glue down the veneer into the pocket. Um, and it is typically so tight, I have to use a roller to actually press the veneer into the, uh, into the pocket. Um, and then after that has been pressed and dried, then again, take your sander, go over the surface of it so that you now have your finished veneered inlay. So that is how easy it is. And then and the final stage, of course, if you would want to clear coat it or protect it or oil it, however you want to actually finish it. Or and then you can use, of course, different colors of veneers. You can get as crazy with it. But that is how simple it is to use a laser system when processing inlay uh, uh, with, uh, with a laser system. And that is, uh, and there's really no better way to do this. Um, there are some more advanced techniques and stuff like that uh, we can get into at a later date, but I'm not going to get into that. But you're able to do inlay details uh, into materials. And it doesn't have to be veneer. It can be other materials. I mean, I've inlaid... Uh, uh, I've inlaid plastic into wood. I've inlaid other materials into itself. And st so lasers are ideal for doing the inlay process. The next one is photo engraving into wood. Photo engraving into wood is awesome. As long as it's a lighter color wood with a lot with not a lot of grain. So here's an example of a large 12 inch by 24 inch piece of cherry wood with this cool iguana engraved directly into it. Now, wood engraving photographs can be some tricky processing. It is, it is not uh, a, 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 a skill that I would suggest for the beginner. Um, it does take a little bit of technique and understanding on how to do photographs. But as you can see here, with good contrast on something like a piece of cherry wood here, you can get stunning photographs. And yeah, you still see the grain in the background, but it really adds to the piece in this case. And so photographs can be easily engraved to it, stick with the tight grain woods, woods that don't have a lot of grain in it, lighter wood so you can produce the contrast. Um, and if you really wanna get into photographs and woods and stuff like that, or any types of photographs, I've done another engraving seminar on photo engraving. So if you scan this QR code right here, it'll take you to the Trotec USA YouTube channel and you can watch, it's about a one hour seminar on just photo engraving techniques. Everything from picking the photo to processing it, to rendering it, to using settings, lenses, materials, all of the above. So if you are interested in doing photographs onto wood and you really want to know more about that, it is kind of a, a whole nother topic. So scan this QR code and you can watch that and really get an understanding of how to process photographs onto woods as well as other materials. Another very popular technique for lasering is the bending applications. Um, lasers are suited for this because it has such a thin kerf or beam diameter that we can produce intricate little cutouts that actually allow the wood to very quickly and easily bend around components. Um, this is great because instead of doing pieces or dovetailing them together or uh, pressing them together or gluing them together, we can wrap around different objects. Um, laser cutting specific geometries into sheet material um, that, that allow this bending to happen. And you can scan this QR code. We have a link to the Trotec YouTube or uh, webpage. And on that webpage, it goes through and explains how this process works 
works uh, step by step, as well as give you the patterns or files for these bending, bending patterns um, so that you can actually practice with them. This is an application that I do suggest that you understand the type of material or wood that you're working with. Again, not all woods are created equal. Um, the MDFs are ideal for this. Plywoods do also is good for this as well. Um, but like thin, thin real wood can be a problem because if you have a lot of grain in them um, and you and your flexible gets too much, as it dries out over time, it can actually cause cracks. Um, it can be difficult to work with, um, depending on how much flexes you have, how thick the material is itself. So really understanding that. And if you want these patterns on how to do this and instructions, scan this QR code with your phone and you can do that. Um, I've also got a bunch of project files here for you. If you scan this QR code and you just want some boxes and cubes and projects that uh, instead of just the patterns, it's the entire project on basically the completed box as well as the cubes, as well as a bunch of other fun different projects that we have done and I have created in the past uh, that you can scan this QR code. It'll take you to a Dropbox link where you can actually download these files and play around with it on your laser system and your material so that you're not trying to design the file itself. Lots of different fun stuff, but this is a very unique application that is uniquely suited for lasering. Um, and in my opinion, on some of these patterns, cannot be produced in any other way. Relief processing, or 3D, uses graphics like this. So 3D, or laser relief, is the process of engraving gradients. And it's not just any gradients. So you can't take a photograph and just engrave it like this. They're, they're generated graphics. And so you take 3D graphics that are generated in 3D, and then we will laser process them. And so in this case, I took that, that, that image of the soldier, and I'm engraving it using the relief mode. And we're going to get into kind of how to do it and how to create these graphics and stuff like that. But this is just to kind of show you what relief is. Relief is the process of actually producing depth or almost a three-dimensional effect by telling the laser system to engrave deeper when it sees darker. So as it sees black, it's going to apply full power. When it sees white, it's going to apply no power. And it's going to change the amount of laser pulse power on every shade of gray. So when it goes over a piece of material like wood, in this case, on a piece of cherry, it produces a three-dimensional or two-and-a-half deed effect. Um, and then combined with cutting out, I can produce a 3D effect. So this is a stunning process that is in the past been done with CNC equipment, um, but it can take a huge amount of time where the laser can do it much, much faster with much greater detail. So this is, a, this is a, a fun, unique process for the laser. Now, it is not as cut and dry uh, on, on how to do that. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually show you the different process once this video is complete on how to do this process. So the first thing comes in when it, when it comes to 3D is file creation. So like I said before, this doesn't work with just a photo. You can't take your photo from your camera or your phone and turn it into 3D. So it needs some type of depth mapping type software. Um, Rhino 3D is one that we use with the laser system. Um, basically, it produces a digital graphic. And so if you look at, say, somebody's face in 3D, if you took a photograph, the whites of the eyes would be brighter than, say, the tip of the nose, where in 3D, the whites of the eyes need to be beyond behind the tip of the nose looking straight at a person so that it sticks out the furthest when engraved. And so 3D mapping software will do that for you. The other way to do that is using 3D scanners or cameras. There are special cameras with multiple angles that are taken, and then that is actually produced a three-dimensional image, which give you this gradient or gray tone mapping. And once you have those graphics, then, of course, you can send it to the laser, and the laser just sees it as a basic uh, uh, grayscale graphic. The difference is we turn a mode called relief mode on, which tells the laser instead of just pulsing it like a photograph, it applies more power to dark areas and less power to light areas and in different power settings to every shade of gray. So as we vary in darkness, the laser will vary in power to produce that effect. 
So understanding how to get these graphics, uh, if you want to create your own, you know, use the 3D advanced 3D software to create your own geometric graphics um, for more advanced type stuff. If you want exotic ones, some places like Rhino 3D here, you can scan this QR code um, or you can do the 3D scanners, but they can be five, six hundred dollars into thousands of dollars for most of your good quality 3D scanners. So it's not something that I would recommend just, you know, buying for just fun once in a while. If you're going to be doing it a lot, um, definitely worth the investment. Um, if you're going to be doing a lot of cr custom creations or logos and graphics and stuff like that, then uh, I also suggest maybe looking into the software. Um, if you do want some some simple files, do you want to practice and play with them here? I got some 3D relief files from Trotec um, to get you started. I believe I have 40 or 50 of them in there. You can scan this QR code and then uh, yeah, so you can kind of practice like this graphic you see here in the center. Um, Gantry Co. is another company that sells 3D graphics and they also will produce them. So if you want the front of your building or your uh, advanced uh, detailed logo created in 3D for you and then just to use that file, you can scan this QR code, go to their site. Um, you can download their clip arts. Their clip arts are kind of expensive. There can be several hundred dollars for each clip art. And so, but you're buying the license to it. So if you're buying them to make Christmas ornaments or a product, it may be worth it. But if you're just doing it to toy around, I believe they do have a couple example ones you can go to, or you can go to our free 3D ones. You can look online, but there's not a lot of options out there for 3D graphics. Now, if you're doing just basic stuff and you want to just, hey, well, I want to do 3D. It's fun. It looks cool. It's unique. It's different. Um, really has a neat perceived value when it comes to etching into wood, especially like you see this center graphic. Well, I'm going to go through a process here of showing how to create basic 3D just in Corel Draw. So Corel Draw, you can draw a black circle and you can go to a feature called Contour. Um, in Contour, you can turn on the feature to center. And again, you can come to this at any time. Set your offset in Corel Draw to 0.001, round your corners, um, set your color balance uh, outline or your, your outline colors to both white and your fill to white. And so what we're doing is we're contouring from black to white. Um, and then we'll adjust our acceleration all the way down here and our color all the way down. And now our contour is set. So if you follow this little video at a later date and hit apply on any black outline, we've now created basic 3D. And this works for any geometric shape or graphic. So if I want to do a square, now all I have to do is select it, hit apply. If I want to do a circle, square, text, whatever, hit apply. Um, if you bring in like a vector logo, like the Trotec logo here, it's vectorized. So what I'll do is convert it to a black outline, remove the fill, and then hit apply. Now I've got a 3D. If I want to engrave that away and everything around it, I place it on a black background, bring the Trotec logo to the front. Now it's going to engrave the background really deep and the logo will stand out. More advanced graphics like this. Maybe I want to cut the piece out and do 3D. I'll hit control D to duplicate. Then I will turn the one to red, which is going to be my cut. Then I'm going to take my original black, and then I'm going to hit apply on 3D. So as long as the image is combined together, and it has to be combined for that process to work, it will then basically take that clip art in this case and combine it into 3D. I then or, uh, group them together or, or center them together. So now I have a filled gradient graphic. 3D type graphic with a red outline on it. So it's gonna engrave the gradient. Now, in some cases, depending on the gradient, you may need to convert the grayscale to a bitmap by hitting bitmaps. Um, and then when you send this to the laser, select the material and then just turn relief mode on. The laser will then select the, know the material, open up uh, job control software, drag it to your uh, your main page, and then go ahead and engrave that out. And the laser will give you a 3D effect on the gradient with a, with a relief, and then it will cut it out. I didn't actually do video footage of that since I already showed you several processes, but it went through and engraved the 3D onto it, and then it cut it out so that we have that stunning effect. And there's the logo that I just did in 3D as well. So we can generate basic graphics. Um, you can come back and watch this if you want to follow along. I'm sorry, I kind of went through a little faster than I think I probably should have, but it, it really does show you the process of how to generate simple 3D gradient graphics just using your graphic design software that most people use with the laser system. You can also do this in Adobe Illustrator, but the process is a little bit different, but just by different gradients, 
and contouring effects, we're basically turning it from white to black. And so the tip of the material itself, as long as it is white, is going to produce a, um, a less laser power. And as we engrave deeper into it, it's going to engrave more laser power and we could get those basic shapes. So download a clip art. Um, bring in your logo, as long as it's vectorized, you know, if you want to combine it together, you can then, uh, once you set up the contour command, just hit apply. Everything you want to select, turns it to 3D, place different objects over the top of other objects. Um, you can even save those as a bitmap, take them into Photoshop to blend them together if you want to, because the laser system only needs to see a bitmap or a JPEG uh, type graphic when it sends to the laser. And as long as you turn the relief mode on, then the laser is going to identify those different settings as different power settings and give you this effect into it. Um, the relief mode is available into the driver. Just make sure you turn that mode on when processing for this capability. Now, the next one is how do you clean it up? You can scrub all the residue that comes out of it, um, but I have another laser hack here. When you engrave, as I showed you earlier with uh, the residue onto it, when you engrave into wood, you get a lot of residue. Well, you can wash this out and scrub it out to make the 3D effect, but I find that it warps the wood and is really problematic when it comes to this. And so cleaning a 3D relief image, I tend to use a sandblaster. And you can pick up one like this for $20. Um, Harbor Freight sells them. You know, throw some sand in it, stick it, plug it into your air compressor and go over the top. Um, if you're doing it a lot, I recommend a couple hundred dollar little cavity um, or you can get a nice or if you have a high uh, quality sandblaster, of course, that would work as well. Um, this this entire piece took less than a minute to sandblast. And what that does, the sandblasting, especially when you get the pressure down, will take the residue off, but it really does not affect the wood itself. And so we've now taken... Uh, a finished result and taking all that residue off. Now we need to add the oil back to it because this process does take it out. So stick a little of the furniture oil back over the top and then we have our finished product. So there's our unclean sample next to sandblasted, next to oil. Um, your before and after right there. So big difference, sandblasting works exceptionally well. It's inexpensive, it's fast, it cleans the material out, gets all those little nooks and crannies out. Um, if your pressure's not too high, it doesn't really affect the wood. And that's really how we are able to get those 3D effects. Um, if you don't have that, you can of course take a brush and you can brush down and pull all that residue off with water, uh, but then you gotta be very careful or clamp it down afterwards um, and hold it flat for could be sometimes days to make sure that it dries perfectly flat and doesn't warp, especially on thinner materials. Um, if it's thicker, yeah, you can get away without sandblasting it and using water um, and it won't warp the wood itself. But thinner materials tend to warp the wood with water. Um, and even the releasing of the process on sandblasting sometimes can warp it itself or not sandblasting, but just the engraving on the one side. So in some cases you do need to wet it down and then clamp it down to keep it from uh, warping. But this is the basic process of not only, you know, how to generate advanced type 3D relief patterns um, using camera systems or generating basic ones in CorelDRAW or downloading it off of places like Gantrico um, and then sending it to your laser, turning the relief mode on and then turning and um, engraving that graphic using the relief mode. I do recommend when engraving them, use more than one pass. You may have saw, seen that in the, the, the videos that were shown before, uh, more than one pass. You don't wanna go really slow. It's gonna burn the wood too much. And so I will typically run two, three, sometimes even four passes on a piece of material. So rather than run at 10% speed at 100% power, maybe I'll run 30% speed with three passes because it's gonna give me a cleaner response um, and it's gonna kind of clean itself up as it goes pass to pass. My total time will be the same because I'm running three times the speed, but my quality is gonna be better. So multiple passes are good. Make sure you stay with materials that don't have a lot of grain in them. Um, I really, my favorite woods for processing 3D is cherry, is like you see here. Um, maple is my second favorite because they're really tight woods. They got great contrast. Um, and, and those are my favorite two materials. There are others, of course, that work, but those are my favorite two materials to work with for 3D or relief. But there are so many different possibilities for processing um, woods and self onto the materials from photos to boxes and shapes and signage, um, jewelry. Uh, a lot of people do jewelry with the laser systems out of wood, <clears throat> but you just use your creativity, use your judgment. 
Um, it is a great material to work with, and I hope I kind of explained all the differences between uh, the types of woods, the styles, kind of the, the uh, problems and concerns that we have with woods. Um, and if you have any questions, of course, po po uh, post them into the comment section. We'll be happy to answer them here in a few minutes. Um, we're going to go through a few updates, and then I'm going to go uh, with uh, Keith o Oten, and we're going to then move forward with our to answer the questions, and then we'll be complete here. A few updates. Um, Trotec has a materials deal of the month, $50 off a $200 purchase on any of our materials. If you scan this QR code, you can go to the Trotec materials site. Um, orders $300 or more are uh, eligible for three sh free shipping. Um, next week, Trotec has the lowest prices of our systems of the year, blowout sale and open houses across the nation. Um, these will be by invite only, so that's safe for the COVID issues. Uh, so they'll be done uh, individually. So you'll be basically done by appointment, coming into the, the actual open houses one at a time for safety reasons um, to see your local Trotec offices. We have 13 different offices uh, around the country. So take advantage of that or call your local uh, distributor and uh, uh, ask him more information. If you want to scan and sign up, scan this QR code for more information on this. If you missed last month's third Thursday on signage techniques, you can scan this QR code. It'll take you to our YouTube channel, our Trotec USA YouTube channel, as well as other third, 30, third Thursday seminars. Um, feel free to make sure you go through and watch them, um, especially with stay at home orders and stuff like that. It's a great time to work on your education on laser systems, watching these seminars and, and webinars to uh, really bring up uh, and improve your skill set when it comes to laser processing. I thank you so much for your time today. Um, now we're going to go ahead and change here to a uh, uh, to our um, our special guest, Keith Oten. Hello. All right, Keith, are you there? I'm here. All right. Well, thank you for joining me, Keith. Um, Keith is a, basically he runs Sawmill Creek. Um, Sawmill Creek is a forum type site and I'll have him explain it. Um, welcome Keith. Um, let's give a little bit about uh, to our audience here. Let's go ahead and kind of give a little bit of your background. Um, what, what is your woodworking and equipment experience background? Well, I've been woodworking for about 45 years, uh, uh mostly continuously. Um, started in junior high school, took some classes in in, uh, in high school, uh, got my own shop, uh, started my own shop when I got married, uh, been in business for a right good while, about 15, 16 years now. So my shop is pretty comprehensive. I have a, just about every machine you would, you'd, uh, normally expect to see in a, uh, a cabinet shop, table saw, uh, band saw, joiner, planer, uh, you know, pretty much everything. I also, I do some metalworking. Because okay. I, I produce a lot of signs. Uh, that's my primary product these days. So uh, I do a lot of uh, wrought iron sign work for hangers, things like that. So I have a metal cutting bandsaw and welding machine and a series of scroll benders for doing scroll work. Cool. Uh, also, you know, and of course now in the last few years, uh, I added uh, laser graving and uh, CNC routing to my to my. Uh, arsenal of tools and equipment awesome going going high tech huh absolutely you bet well great um well you run sawmill creek what is sawmill creek sawmill creek is a woodworking forum that uh i started uh let's see we're in our 18th year now wow. so um we honestly it, it started from bad uh, badger pond it was a woodworking forum called badger pond that uh the gentleman who owned and operated badger pond Ran it for five years and decided to go offline. Uh, I was just a regular member of Badger Pond, but at the time I owned an internet service provider business, and I had I had multiple servers and plenty of bandwidth. So everybody was looking for a place to go. Uh, the community was well established, so I kicked in there and I said, "Hey, I can buy the software. I have a server here. I'll install it. Everybody, you know, come on down." And that's how Salmon Creek got started. Basically, initially it was a uh, um, it was a, um, uh, an, a venture that, uh, that we did as a community service type of, type of effort, but it grew and grew and grew so quickly, so large, it became basically a, 
semi-commercial, if you will. Uh, so, uh, but the Creek has, we have approximately 132,000 registered members. Wow. And currently we're at about 2.9 million posts. Wow. We do, we do 40 to 60,000 unique visitors a day. Outstanding. So gr great. It sounds like a great resource for the woodworker, laser mm -hmm. operator, owner, you know, to get, get a lot of information. Um, yeah. how, do you, how do you become a member? Or well, how, do you, uh, how do you sign up? Uh, www.summitcreek.org and uh, um, you'll see the registration at the top. Click the button, um, create a username and password, pretty much like you do with any any site, right. and uh, and you're in. Uh, the majority, all of our forms are absolutely free, uh, no cost to anybody. We have some additional services that we, we uh, people uh, make a small donations like fifty cents a month. Okay. To, to have access to everything. Okay. Um, including our free stuff drawings and giveaways and what have you. I told you earlier in the past, we, we gave away a Trotec, a brand new Trotec laser that Trotec oh. uh, donated. Uh, we've given away CNC routers and just about any kind of machine you can imagine all the way down to packs of sandpaper. <laughs> so, uh, the, so it the definitely stuff. sound like 50 cents a month may be worth it to get into those types <laughs> of things. <laughs> Absolutely. You can't beat it. But we have, we have an, an amazing community um that we that that we've attracted through the years uh people with a tremendous talent uh and our la our laser engraving forums forum is absolutely amazing and people people have uh more way more experience and expertise than i do so i uh i'm often able to get get some good advice myself okay. uh, i do i do a lot of laser engraving but i'm not as i don't do as 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 very uh, types of projects as, as a lot of people do because I'm a sign maker, you know, <laughs> no, I understand. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you for joining me to help answer the questions. Uh, definitely nice to have somebody with your skill set and background mm -hmm. to, to help answer these questions. And so that's why we tend to like to bring somebody like yourself out. And so Corey, our, our controller here is going to go ahead and go ahead and post some questions. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead and read, read it out. Um, and then uh, if it applies to me, I'll go ahead and add, ask, answer it. And, you know, if it applies to you or back and forth, we'll, we'll cover these questions. Mm -hmm. um, let's get started here. Um, origami I-77, what is the power of the laser for the connector clip? Um, of the connector clip that I ran there, I was just running an 80-watt laser, but that was eighth-inch material. So realistically, any wattage will work on something like that. And that was an MDF, uh, veneer-faced MDF wood uh, that I was cutting in that case. 100, uh, 170 inches per second is your motor speed, uh, or can it actually engraving take place at that speed? Please explain. Okay, um, 170 inches per second is our motor speed or our linear inches per second on our motion system. So that is basically as that head moves back and forth, it's covering 170 inches in one second. Um, and that is the speed of the machine itself. And so the engraving takes place of uh, as it goes across vertically. Um, it, it's not actually engraving 170 inches down in a second. It's, it's going back and forth as the motor speed at 170 inches per second. Are uh, the large format glue uh, tube machines glass tube? No, they are not. They are a solid core lasers. Um, uh, uh, they are water chilled, but they are not glass core. How do you exhaust the smoke from the laser system? Um, the, there are several different ways you can exhaust the smoke from a laser system. Um, m the most common is, of course, a, any type of ventilation system. Um, a high pressure blower is recommended to blow it outside or a filtration unit is, is typically used if you can't exhaust it outside. Uh, how do you typically do it, Keith? I, I use a dust collector. You just do a shop dust collector, yeah. Shop dust collector and blow it mm -hmm. outside. Okay. You bet. Can a laser cut Corian? Hi, Keith actually mentioned that earlier. Do you want to cover this one? Yeah, the answer, the short answer is no. Uh, you you can cut Corian if you make a lot of passes uh, on on say quarter inch. Uh, I've I've cut half inch before, but it took so many passes it wasn't practical. Practical. So, uh, but yeah, Corian engraves extremely well. It is a beautiful material. 
Um, actually, it's funny as last week I did my signage tutorial and uh, with 120 watts, I was able to cut through half an inch beautifully. You did. Uh, That's yeah, it's like, it's like edge quality that even blew my mind. Now, wow. it, it seems to also matter what type of, or brand. Corian has kind of become the tissue of, of uh, solid surface material. It is, um, there are a lot of different brands out there and I was using a different brand and it cut beautifully. And so I was cutting half of an inch, but it does take a lot of laser power. So what wattage do you have, Keith, on your laser? 80, 80 watt. Oh, okay. Yeah, 120, I was able to do it. 80 would, would I would say quarter inch, no more than a quarter of an inch would mm -hmm. be pushing it on an 80 watt. Um, is job control vision available on the Speedy 100? Um, the answer, unfortunately, is no. The vision system is only available on the Speedy 300 and up on our systems. To cut half an inch with a two inch lens, what wattage uh, do you typically need? Um, that is, as I kind of explained, half an inch is depending on the material itself. If you're cutting, uh, uh, you know, a half an inch balsa wood, um, you, you could probably do it with a 30 watt. Um, but if you're cutting a half of an inch, you know, maple, then it's going to take an 80 watt or more. Um, so it really depends on the density of wood that you're actually trying to cut uh, with the two inch lens. Um, so density does make a difference on whether or not you can cut through that material. I've not had luck getting high contrast on maple with a 50 watt two inch lens. Is there a secret to it? Um, secret. I, I mean, I've not had any issue with getting contrast. The, the key when it comes to getting contrast with the lasers, of course, hit it with more power, um, slow it down a little bit. If you do want a little more contrast and you're, you're okay with it, you can take it out of focus a little bit. It'll actually broaden the beam out. And then that will actually allow more heat to build up in the material, producing greater contrast by co creating more creosote down into the engraving itself. Um, but more power, slower speed to get better contrast for deeper mark. And so, uh, and then also making sure, you know, playing with your focus a little bit can make a big difference as well. Have you had any uh, uh, issues getting contrast on the maple, Keith? No, maple, maple's an excellent wood to use. Um, and I agree with your list of, of woods. I might add one thing, uh, hickory, uh, for those people who have access to it in their local area, it engraves beautifully. It's really hard, really dense, but you get an extremely good, nice, dark mark. And it doesn't have a lot of grain in it. I haven't done a lot of hickory. It, it has some grain, but um, finished properly and what have you. Uh, I've, I've done some plaques from hickory for customers. They look, they were just amazing. And there's a very similar contrast to maple, right? Uh, a little darker, if you will. Okay. Probably, um, uh, yeah, I, yeah, it's probably close to, to, to maple. Okay. Well, it's a good alternative if you, if you are having problems with that. Yeah. Right. Do you have a PDF of the wood list? I do not. Um, if you want to email us, I'm, I'm sure I can create one. You also can do a screen grab or I can uh, I can create one and send it to you. Send me an email and I'll send you a PDF of that wood list. I just pulled that wood list off of Wikipedia, actually. So if you did go into Wikipedia and you type in species of wood, that's where the list and I just reformatted it into that that nice looking slide. Can we download the Aztec calendar file? Um, I don't, I, I think that it is available for download. I don't have the Aztec calendar file on our website or anything, but you can email me and I can, I can get it to you. I definitely have the file. I just don't know anywhere the, uh, publicly that it's actually posted right now. There's a couple of forums on uh, YouTube, uh, not YouTube, um, Facebook. That, uh, oh. that they posted the, those files. And there's multiple types of files. There's a, a Batman calendar, Aztec, King Tut, what have you. We have two or three of them on, on Sawmill Creek. Oh, there you go. Sign up for Sawmill Creek and ask. I bet you a lot of people give it to you. Or contact us and we'll get it to you. We have that file. You bet. Are the parameters and job controls set for specific thicknesses? Um, the answer for that is yes and no. It depends on the material that you're working with. Uh, most of the wood ones are not set for a thickness, or they're all kind of preset for three millimeter or uh, an eighth of an inch thickness. Um, you can, of course, make your own preset for um, uh, uh, wood itself for different thicknesses. So, for example, if I'm cutting 
if, if this, the preset is set for eighth of an inch and you're going to design uh, and maybe make a, a new setting for quarter of an inch, just drop your power setting in half since you're doubling in thickness. So it's a really kind of an easy way to, to identify the, the correct settings. So if you're setting for eighth of an inch, that's preset is at, uh, you know, 1% speed and you're cutting, you're doubling it uh, to a, a, a material that is a quarter of an inch, take it down to 0.5% speed. So you're doubling the thickness, drop the, the power in half or the speed in half. And there you go. So the answer is it is for certain thicknesses, but not for all thicknesses, but it's pretty easy to just double or drop your settings down to and create your own setting. It, it appears that there's paper underneath the pieces as they're being cut. Is that correct? The paper underneath the pieces that are being cut. Um, I'm not. Ah, uh, I, I see what in a lot of my videos I have paper around it. It's not underneath. It is around it. It just it, it creates a better uh, background for my videos. There's nothing underneath. What I'll typically do is place a transfer tape or a paper onto my cutting table as I'm cutting them. Um, one, it kind of creates a better vacuum and allows the exhaust to be pulled out, but two, it looks better in the video. And that's primarily the reason I do it. So you don't see the, the scorched up cutting table around it and allows you to focus on the part that's being cut. What is the best way to clean off wood residue without using water, soap, alcohol? Um, I'm, I'm etching, engraving some delicate pieces and violins. Uh, masking doesn't always work through the shape. Um, Keith, do you have an answer to this one? Since you do more woodworking, do you have, a, do you have a, a, a secret sauce, if you will, when it comes to trying to clean some exotic woods that are not finished, for example? Uh, I, you know, I just, I just agree with what you said during your presentation. If it's, a, if it's real detail, small, uh, small detail work, uh, you got to be very careful. Sanding is not always an option. Uh, the the sandblasting that 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 you're using uh, worked seemed to work extremely well. I've done some sandblasting and I've used um, uh, walnut shells. To yeah, sandblast. That's a good idea. Uh, I've yeah. never tried that. Yeah, you can purchase walnut shells for sandblasting, and uh, that's very soft. Uh, yeah, for, for so very it won't delicate hurt the wood woods. fibers. It won't right. hurt the wood fibers, but it may very well take the resins off. That's a great yeah. uh, possibility. I, yeah. I think maybe it may be worth a try. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had pretty good luck with the uh, walnut shells. Oh, that's good, good, a good, a good, a good idea. I might have to order some and see if that works. Because the goal yeah. is sand can actually uh, ablate the finishes and it can actually take some of the detail off. On 3D, it's fine, but mm -hmm. trying to do it on something like a violin where you got a lot of detail and you can't mask, you don't want to pick it off. Uh, that may be a good alternative and something that uh, I will have in a future seminar because I gotta, I gotta showcase it and try it and see where that uh, that detail lies. If it can hold the detail without damaging the wood, is the goal. Sure. And take, taking the residue off. Okay. Um, do you have information on settings for cuts that will allow bending um, uh, of the MDF? Uh, I mean, cutting of the MDF for bending is the same as just cutting at any time. So using the presets for MDF or veneered MDF for uh, it's the same <coughs> for the bending process. The difference is the file itself. Now, the closer the bend uh, cuts are together, the, the more flexible it's going to become. And so that, that's where uh, some of the settings are are. are are necessary, uh, but the power setting to cut through is no different for the bending as it is for any other cut. Does trocoff equal easily warp? Um, the, sh the, the, the sheets lay flat. Um, it does not warp because it is a resin type material. I have found that it lays exceptionally flat um, due to the cellulose type makeup of the material itself. Um, it stays extremely flat. It cuts extremely fast, and it's it's the strongest wood-like material that I have ever worked with on uh, uh, with a laser system. So definitely worth a try. Get a sample piece and give it a shot. Have you tried it yet, uh, Keith? The, the, no, I haven't tried happened. it. I, a, I've never I never had any problem with uh, with most uh, engraving materials. Uh, if you use the proper uh, uh, settings and don't use too much heat. Uh, you know, it's they're very reliable as far as remaining flat. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Trocraft Eco is nice because it you're able to get down to thicknesses thinner than a sixteenth of an inch, mm -hmm. still cut it and curve it and flex it. Mm -hmm. um, and it probably has about, tw in my opinion, the, the about twice the rigidity and, and, and density of even MDF. So it just wow. takes it to that next level. So it's a, it's a great new material to work with. And it just came out uh, in the last year. So I'll have to try it. it. 
Yeah, it's a really neat material to play with. Mm -hmm. um, do all these veneered MDFs cut at the same settings? Um, this is going to depend on where you get them from. Now, if you buy them from, um, you know, uh, somebody like Trotec, then yes, absolutely. The veneer on the surfaces are very, very thin. The MDF core is the primary material. So it really doesn't change the power settings if you're going from a, a bambooed veneer to a maple veneer, for example. Um, have you come across any different types of veneered MDFs that have any differences in power setting, Keith? No, I haven't. Okay. Do you have a sample pack of laser bow woods that we carry? I believe we do. Contact uh, our, uh, go to our materials website. Um, I can have Corey put it up on our screen here um, and you can, uh, you can definitely uh, apply for a sample pack. Um, and none of these coatings, even polyurethane, will give a noxious fumes from being engraved and cut. Any smoke residue that comes out of the laser is going to produce fumes that you do not want to breathe. This is why ventilation is key. Um, plastics, woods, residues, yeah, even just raw woods produced formaldehyde, you don't want to breathe any of them. Um, polyurethanes and stuff like that are going to produce a small amount, but there's such a small amount of it on there that it's really, it's not going to cause any issues. Just make sure your system is ventilated properly. You not, Have you had any issues with that, Keith? No, dust collection is a big deal, uh, you know, and it, you can you can overdo dust collection, no question. But generally speaking, a, a one and a half to two horsepower dust collector uh, on a four inch uh, uh, PVC outlet works just fine. I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, where can I buy that wood roller? Oh, the roller that I use for the veneer. I, I, I just purchased it online. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, where, where do you buy your rollers, Keith? Maybe a good question for you. I, I bought a set years ago, and it, it uh, I think it's when I was doing um, some uh, rubber stamps, and it came with a roller handle and, uh, and three different, uh, like a hard plastic, a soft plastic, and a wooden roller, so you could just change them out. Oh, uh, but I can't remember, I can't remember where I got that. I've had it for many years, still use it today. Well, I mean, just, just so you know where I bought that one you saw in the video, I just purchased it on Amazon. Uh, but most of your wood suppliers have rollers for doing the veneers or cabinetry shops. Uh, uh, most of your wood wood uh, websites is, of course, going to carry it. Um, I believe you can even get rollers at most of your hardware stores. I, I guess in a pinch, you could use a wooden dowel. There you go. Or, or, or uh, what, what I say, some, somebody I saw using a, 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 one of those rolling pins for, for cooking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> sneak, sneak into the kitchen and boil yeah, your wife. Yeah, especially oh, the metal ones. Yeah. <laughs> Don't uh, tell your wife. Uh, <laughs> okay, what power settings are used for veneer? Um, veneer is just a thin wood. What kind of power settings do you typically use, Keith? God, I can't. I can't remember. Okay. I don't do a lot. I don't do a lot of thin veneer. Uh, you know, mostly most of what I do these days is, and for the last ten years, has been. Corian and and some some uh, some wood species for for inlays. Okay, um, settings that I use it's just thin wood is all it is, and so depend and it's usually pretty uh, the density is pretty consistent. I, I'm usually using 100% power, and I'm going through it as fast as I can cut through it, which is typically mm -hmm. um, it depends on the wattage and of course the speed of your laser system that can vary very greatly. And so take your speed or your power to 100%, and then just bring your speed up until you're cutting through. Usually to dial in a test to make sure I'm cutting through properly, I will do like a, a, a little square with a circle in it or a square with rounded corners so I get a radius and a straight. Um, and then I will cut using uh, as fast as I can get through it. And once I find that setting, I will dial that in. Um, but it's usually just a fast a, a fast speed, it, it, you know, a little bit uh, slower than something like paper, depending on the thickness, of course, of the veneer mm -hmm. and the density. Can VCarve software be used for creating 3D files? I am not familiar with VCarve. You familiar with that, Keith, at all? Yes, I've used VCarve. I started using VCarve in it when I bought my first uh, CNC router, uh, and then I graduated to the uh, their their next next higher tier product called Aspire. But um, the answer is that's a tough question. Yes, you can do 3D files with VCarve and Aspire. Uh, two and a half D. Uh, as 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 was mentioned earlier, but uh, today with the with the with the the uh, 
uh, the later versions of, of V Carbon and Aspire, uh, there are provisions to flip it over and machine both sides and do an, a, a real 3D file. Hmm. So it may be maybe something you need to look into. Unfortunately, um, you know, since I'm not, we're not familiar with because laser 3D is a little different than your CNC 3D. Um, in the fact that we use um, uh, mapping basically. And, and so as, if the graphic can be converted to a grayscale um, and that grayscale varies in shades of gray based on darkness and depth, that's what it comes down to. So that's why a typical photograph doesn't work. And it usually requires 3D modeling software. So most of your 3D softwares that I have come across will do this, but you wanna check with them. Uh, maybe download some of the examples that I have provided in the QR codes so you know what it looks like, and then contact the companies that make these uh, CNC type softwares and see if there is a mean to convert the graphic into that look type of graphic. That would be my suggestion. It is, it's commonly done for lithophanes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, that's, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Lift the game to yeah. be the same process. Yeah. Ah, but can 3D files be imported into Corel Draw? Um, 3D files are basically just gradient graphics. Um, the the software that has created them produces just a bitmap or JPEG. Um, the, the STL and the 3DS type formats cannot be in, imported into it, but they typically can be converted to a gradient um, pixelated graphic like a bitmap, a TIFF, or a JPEG. And then those can be imported into Corel Draw or Illustrator or whatever design software you're processing from. Where do you order the large masking tape, um, transfer tape? Um, I get it from just JDS or any sign supply shop. Keith, do you have a specific supplier you use for your transfer tapes? Same as you, uh, JDS or Johnson Plastics. Johnson Plastics also sells it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Most sign warehouses or sign warehouses, uh, yeah, you can get it online. Uh, it's uh, something like Amazon really didn't carry too much transfer tape, but most sign supply, I do suggest JDS, Johnson Plastics, um, uh, sign supply type places will always carry it. In a pinch, the uh, regular sign vinyl works pretty good. You can't cut it with your with your laser because it's vinyl. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, if you're, if you're rough roughing something out with CNC or something like that, or you you have to cut it by hand or what have you, but in a pinch that works. I have a question for you. What about the the orange material you guys are using for masking? Uh, well, uh, you mean the 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 blazer orange uh, masking? Blazer orange, yes. Yeah, that that stuff is designed for sandblasting, as we had in our our a couple of weeks ago. We did a, a, a third Thursday on sandblasting. Okay. It'd be a little expensive to use just for basic masking. Okay. Um, because it is designed to stretch around for for the sandblasting rigidity. So yes, okay. it would work uh, as a mask if you needed it to, and uh, and you're welcome to do that in a pinch. Um, but the the cost of paper mask, you can pick pick up a, you know, a 12 inch wide roll, 100 yards long for twenty dollars. And so, it's but you but you might you might have a round object or an odd shaped object. Oh, great! Where it, it would certainly be worth the additional cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the blazer orange wouldn't be nice if you need to wrap it mm -hmm. around something because it is flexible. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Are there 3D mapping programs that are free that will work for this process? Ah, uh, um, I've never come across one that produces a decent 3D images. Um, Google or, or SketchUp, uh, which used to be Google, um, will produce a 3D, but it doesn't produce the right topographical lithocaine type uh, 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 3D graphic that I've come across. So unfortunately, <coughs> if anybody knows of one, let me know, but I've never come across one that does a decent job besides your standard uh, design softwares for doing general 3D. Have you come across any 3D software that is free, Keith? No, I sure yeah. haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have it if it was available. Yeah, right, me too. <laughs> Somebody at Sawmill Creek would have recommended it a long yeah. time ago. Yeah. 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 <laughs> What version of Corel Draw was used for 3D? I have done the, the gradient contouring effect that I showed you on my process on every version, starting in version 12, I think, and up. So the last uh, 18 years worth of Corel Draws will all do that same process. Um, the location of contour may be in a little different place on the older versions, uh, but contouring effect, all you're doing is contouring from a black outline to a white outline. Um, so it fades from black to white. And that's all there is to it. So realistically, any version that you can get um, in the last decade will, will work just fine with that process. 
Is there an Adobe Illustrator equivalent to the contour feature? Yes, there is, but I have not uh, gone through and actually done a tutorial on that. And I can't off the top of my hand even remember what it's called. Um, but it, it, yeah, gradient contouring is what you can do a quick Google search for it. Um, and maybe in a future type uh, webinar type series, we can do more of an Adobe Illustrator contouring effect. So it is possible. I have seen it. I have used it. Uh, but off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you what the feature was called. Does the Speedy 100 do relief? Absolutely. Speedy 100 uses job control software, which includes the release capa relief capability. So all you have to do is turn that mode on um, and uh, let it rip. Can you clean the 3D engraved wood with alcohol instead of water? Um, Keith, maybe a good question for you. I, I can't say I've used alcohol, but I, I would imagine you could. And certainly it would uh, it would flash dry pretty quick. Yeah. So, I mean, it would be worth trying. Maybe we're trying. I've never actually tried that myself. Um, mm -hmm. And alcohol is in short supply right now. But uh, <laughs> it is uh, maybe a good idea so that it doesn't cause the warping instead of uh, where water tends to warp the woods after you, when you try to clean it. So Exactly. Yeah, definitely worth a shot. A good idea. But uh, I don't really have an answer. Uh, what is the grit blasting metedia? And that uh, that is a good question. Um, I was using a, a pretty fine blasting. I'm trying to remember. I, I believe I was using 220 grit when I was doing it, which is a, a nice fine grit. And then as Keith mentioned, maybe using the walnut, uh, which is going to produce it. Do you use any specific grit in your sandblaster, Keith? No, I've only found walnut in, in, in just a, a moderate grit uh, to buy uh, locally. Um, you, might, you might try... Um, Glass beads. Oh, yes. I, they're, I've they're not terribly glass. aggressive. No, I, I also have glass beads. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of like a, a much higher uh, content. I, when it comes to this, I have found um, the more aggressive you get, it tends to kind of punch into it a little bit more. Um, yeah. It's a little bit quicker, but you can lose some detail. Right. Um, as you go to the finer one, it takes a little longer, but you lose less detail all the way up to, say, the walnut grid, I think would be good. I, the, the key is, is does it does it does a really good job at removing residue? That's to be determined. I I'll, I'll, uh, maybe a good laser hack video for me mm -hmm. to showcase uh, the different grits and how how it can work with uh, wood residue um, from laser process. So mm -hmm. stay tuned. I'll add that to my list. Can you three D engrave into acrylic? Have you ever done that, Keith? I haven't, but uh, I've, I've I've seen you. I've seen some information about it on on Trotex website. Yeah. Absolutely, you, you can. Bet. Yeah, absolutely, you can. 3D onto acrylic, it gives you the same effect. Um, there are a few differences in the fact that it's more of a translucent type look. Um, you want to go more passes because, uh, especially if you use a cast acrylic, it can produce a lot of white residue onto it. Um, and so I will typically go over it and then I will open up the machine and blow it off. And then I will hit another pass and another pass <clears throat> so that you don't get a buildup of residue because the acrylic especially cast acrylic can build up a lot of residue when doing 3d and then when i'm finished and getting the amount of depth i take the laser out of focus a half of an inch and then i go over it again and it glazes it it actually kind of polishes it all together and it can produce this almost molded look into into thicker acrylic uh, but i do suggest you'll get warping onto the acrylic as well because it releases the tension um, that you use much thicker piece of acrylic if you're planning on trying that I have an 80 watt 360, what recommended uh, for running 3D, what settings? Um, 3D, it's, again, it's going to depend on the material density. If you're dealing with cherry or maple, I will typically run at 100% power uh, between 20 and 30% speed at two and three passes. So the, so I'm running 20 to 30% speed, depending on the amount of depth that you want into it. Um, what, what You said you had a machine. Do you, have you ever done any 3D, Keith, on your machine? Um, no, I haven't done any 3D, but uh, I'm interested in lithophanes, which is a similar. Yeah, same process. Uh, same process. Um, I, I, I had a uh, pretty good conversation with Don Mayhew, who works for Trotec down in, yeah. in Georgia. Uh, he and I and James Booth met at an Aspire event in Columbia, South Carolina. And we were discussing the problem with lithophanes with CNC is it takes so long. Yeah. You, and you have to use such a small router bit, they tend to break on you and it gets costly. So the idea between the three of us was to rough cut with a CNC, move over to laser grave 
and finish it, finish a lithophane that way. I haven't tried that, but it's it's on my uh, it's on my radar and for the near term. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that if it be. works, if it works, it's going to be the highest quality lithophane that you could <laughs> produce. I've done lith lithophanes on lasers, and uh, it works just as well as a 3D. It does give you the detail. And, of course, mm -hmm. the hogging out detail, if you have a CNC and you can transfer it, as long as yeah. the orientation is, is kept um, as close as you can, because most mm -hmm. of the detail will be added, yeah, the, it will work outstanding. That's sure. kind of give you the best of both worlds there. But it sounds like to me you're with 120 watt, you have a more than enough power to, to even hog out. Nope. Well, yeah, you could definitely do it. I think in the yeah. in the scheme of things, if you got enough laser power, you'll find just doing it on the laser is going to be the fastest process. Mm -hmm. um, jumping back and forth in the setting and the programming time like that, the the laser would have been done. Um, so um, definitely, if you have both, you know, and if you're doing a very large one, for example, right. then mm -hmm. it would be beneficial to use the CNC for the large removal and mm -hmm. then the detail on the laser. If you're doing something small, then just the laser, I think. Sure. How well do lasers engrave antler? <laughs> um, it actually engraves beautifully. Um, the smell is obnoxiously bad. <laughs> you're nothing like the smell of burning flesh and bone when you're engraving it, but it does a, a stunning job into it. Have you engraved antler there, uh, Keith? I haven't engraved antler, but yeah. a bunch of guys on Soma Creek have. There's a there's a bunch of fabulous pictures. Uh, and the detail they've been, they've been able they would get is just amazing, and uh, the mark is great. Yeah, but, uh, but everybody complains about the smell. <laughs> the smell, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's the yeah. Once you do it, you can't get that back. You never take it away, and it just lingers. So yeah, yeah. It, it definitely does a great job on the laser. Does um, <laughs> power settings? I would play around with them. Some samples. Um, it's not something I would. Um, yeah, high power, low speed. It's a very dense material, but it does a great job with the laser. Uh, mm -hmm. Just uh, just uh, get some Febreze. <laughs> uh, can the laser cut and, or engrave material such as high uh, uh, HDU, high density urethane? Yeah, absolutely, uh, high density urethane is a is a thermoplastic. Um, it does have a lower melting point, so it can melt a little on the edge. So it, we can definitely engrave it, no problem. You do get a little bit of a melty effect and it's not a great contrast material. So yes, it can cut, it can engrave just like any plastic, but the quality on HDU is, um, it's not great when it's nothing like acrylic when it comes to uh, laser engraving. So the ans short answer is yes, no problem in doing it. Um, the long answer is the quality is uh, not as good as say some of the harder plastics like acrylic. You'd want to you'd want to paint fill or resin fill or epoxy yeah. fill uh, in order to get the contrast anyway. I think. I think you're right. You know, mask it first, etch through it, and then and rub some paint into it, and then peel the mask off. That's right. a great idea, Keith. Mm -hmm. What is used for the masking material? What would you recommend for puzzles? Um, I use just standard transfer tape. Um, it's got to be laser friendly type masking. So you don't want to use like the vinyl if you're doing a lot of laser cutting mm -hmm. onto it. Um, transfer tape is, uh, is typically, you can use even like blue painter's tape, the nice wide rolls, depending on, of course, how big of an object you're actually trying to mask. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is how sticky the tack level. Um, you know, if you're, if you're masking raw wood, sometimes it has a hard time sticking to that surface if it's not sanded smooth. So be careful with that. So do you use anything specific, Keith, on, on your woodworking when masking? Uh, I use a variety of things, but I use the masking like that you recommended, uh, the same that you use for vinyl material. But uh, that's available in 6-inch, 12-inch, and even 24-inch even wide rolls. Yeah. And, it, and it's very affordable. Very affordable, but yeah. For CNC, I use vinyl masking a lot because the vinyl mask, the vinyl material will stick. To the yeah. to the wood and 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 uh, withstand the, the the abrasiveness from from the router bit. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, on laser we can't do that. But if you go right. with a high, if you go with a high tack mm -hmm. um, uh, um, transfer masking, case, masking yeah, case, you can do that. Now there are alternatives to vinyl out there, like the Envision print wrap film from 3M, which looks, acts, and feels just like vinyl, but it's made of polyester, so it is laser friendly. It's hard to get and it's expensive, but if, it, if there is a pinch, there are alternatives out there where you can mask these types of woods that may, may not stick down with traditional masking material. Mm -hmm. How well would redwood cut uh, or make a relief? 
Um, red wood is a kind of in between wood. It's not. It is a. It is a softer wood, so um, it tends to have a little bit of grain. It's not too bad, but uh, you know, it, it, and it is a medium tone wood, so it produces some good contrast when engraving. Um, it is. It's kind of got the. I would say the softness of what. What would you say, uh, Keith? Like a pine, maybe into uh, poplar type type density. Um, yeah, uh, pine, but, poplar, cedar. Yeah. yeah. Um, redwood. I'm on the East Coast, so there's not a lot of redwood here. <laughs> so it'd be it'd be a little more. It'd be quite expensive, I expect. Yeah, I haven't done a lot of redwood, but um, in in my case, it it um it works just fine with the laser cuts and engraves. Mm -hmm. Like I say, if you have like a poplar setting or something like that, it it is on your softer side of woods, and mm -hmm. so it, it's going to cut and engrave beautifully. Yeah. How do you keep consistent depth for wood veneers? Um, this is can be tricky depending on grain. Um, if you have a lot of grain in the wood, something like you're engraving um, like pine, for example, to do an inlay, that can be tricky because uh, the grain can vary basic, uh, the, dense, uh, the depth can actually vary on the engraving. Um, that can be a problem because uh, when you go to place your veneer, some areas can be too deep, other areas can stick up above. My suggestion in this case is to kind of average the difference. Uh, make sure you use a veneer that's thick enough that kind of sticks up and it does require a little bit more sanding afterwards, um, but those excess areas kind of fill with glue and then it really looks seamless once you're finished. There's no way to eliminate that unless you go to a CNC machine for the engraving and then you cut your veneer with the, with the laser itself and then put those two together so that you have the consistent background. Um, density can cause some serious problems. I didn't put a slide in my presentation, but I had one where you could actually see at an angle the the actual variation um, of engraving on some of these uh, grainy materials uh, for inlay. Um, but it, it is something that you have to be concerned about, and there's really no way around it on the laser side uh, of avoiding that, except for compensating for it, like I said. Yeah, pine pitch is also an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Use laser for 3D engraving wood or CNC router, which is the better option? Maybe that's a good question for you, Keith, because you actually use both and I do not. Um, engraving wood, uh, C, uh, CNC is hard to hard to beat, uh, particularly on very large projects. CNC is very fast, um, and the, the, the depth varies automatically if you're going to V-carve text, uh, so it's hard to beat. Uh, 3D engraving is depending on if it's very small detail, the laser is going to be the way to go every time. But if it's a large sign or something like that, CNC is 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 really easy to do. Yeah, and it's faster, way faster. Yeah, yeah it's very fast. Yeah, my suggestion is exactly what I have seen in the past. A large area engraving, the CNC is smoother. The background is consistent. It's smooth. Um, the 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 best is of course if you have both. Um, if you do all the hogging out in detail in uh, or, or the the in V grooves and stuff like that with your CNC, and then stick it in the laser to add intricate details and and additional 3D relief patterns, um, the combination of both is unbelievable. Yeah, um, exactly. If you have both, then and you can do things you can't do with either one. The two machines complement each other just amazingly. I mean, they're just there's nothing like owning both machines, and it really does help with the, with the profit margins, right? Right? Yeah. Sounds good. I know I need to get one in my warehouse. The laser grave inlays look fantastic. Yeah. Big, big CNC sign with a laser grave extreme detail uh, inlay. They look just fabulous. Perfect. Uh, how do you convert STLs and gradient to grayscale bitmap or TIFF? Any design software can export uh, STL to a bitmap TIFF. Oh, there are softwares. I had a guy that did that for me. STLs for those in, are, are a, um, it's a format of 3D type modeling software, typically done in like SolidWorks um, and 3DS type softwares. Because the to, to convert them to a grayscale uh, usually requires special software. I had a guy that actually did it, but he didn't tell me what software he actually used for it. I do know there are softwares that will convert STLs into a uh, uh, basically that topographical gradient and then can export as a bitmap or JPEG. You can also do like, uh, you know, if you got like a nice 4K monitor, you can do like a, a decent screen grab and it'll work just fine as long as you're not engraving too large since we're typically dealing with 
um, smaller engravings. Um, that's a quick and easy way to do it. If, you, if it's on the screen in gradient uh, on, on your software, you do a quick screen grab on a 4K monitor. It actually does a great job. But to convert it to a true high def TIFF, that does require some software. I do know it's out there, but unfortunately I don't have the name of that software that does it. Mm. Anybody use baking soda for sandblasting cleaning? I have heard of that, but I have never used it. Keith, have you ever come across that or used it? I've, I've never used it, but it's it's a common practice. Um, yeah. uh, you, can, you can buy, um, I think they even make a special, um, uh, Harbor Freight or somebody sells a very inexpensive uh, baking soda blasting setup. Yeah, I do uh, know Harbor Freight sells a lot of the aggregate and it's, and that's a, and it's very inexpensive there. So maybe yeah. worth a try. Um, but for Sue, for Sue here, that, that is a question I don't, I, uh, um, we haven't used it. Uh, maybe a question if somebody knows the answer, they can post it here. But uh, it, it, I, I can't see why it would be less abrasive than even something like uh, walnut shells. So uh, maybe mm -hmm. worth a try for future uh, process. Techniques. Also, uh, just a thought, you know, since we're kicking this around, walnut shells in a vibratory, vibratory tumbler might work really well for small laser engraved projects. Hmm. You're familiar oh, with the vibratory oh, tumbler? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, kind of like a, a rock tumbler. So basically, just rotate your products around it and kind of takes all the edges and curves. Except around. for the vibratory, they don't they don't rotate. Oh, like that's right. Just, it's like they, they, they jump up and down kind of thing. Good so idea. that may that may that may be an option for some people. Hmm, I might have to get one. Yeah, they're they're <laughs> pretty inexpensive. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, and that would really kind of deburr a lot of those little components. Maybe I'll, even take the the engraving residue off. I'll tell you why I know. I I do a lot of ADA signs, so I laser cut all of my tactile text, so they're small small letters, you know, about five eighths tall. And in order to in order to break that that um, sharp edge, which is required by the uh, by the ADA specifications, I, I just I throw them all in a tumbler. Uh, and I throw in some nuts and bolts to, to add a little weight and I tumble them and they come out with just oh. really nice smooth edges. That's a great idea. Kind yeah, of, kind of deburrs and takes off. I wonder yeah. if it'll take, uh, you know, wonder if that process will take uh, the, the resins that come from wood engraving and take it off. It, possibly. I yeah. haven't tried it, but I, I would imagine. Great it. idea. It's a great yeah. idea. It's worth a it's shot. Certainly, it's certainly very inexpensive. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. worth a shot. So good idea. Lots of new, new techniques that we can give it a shot. That's that's what mm -hmm. I do. What is the best and easiest way to remove uh, the soot created on the edges when cutting MDF? Um, uh, it, mine is leaving some no matter how much you clean it. Un unfortunately, you'll never be able to reduce that black edge that comes from the cutting because the laser is literally cutting with pure heat. And so you can, I typically will, if, if you've got a lot of creosote that sticks to your fingers and stuff like that, I will, I will wipe it off with a damp cloth, but it's always going to be black. Um, or, or dark brown. Now, higher wattages can cut through faster, so it's not going to be so black um, just because you can cut through quicker, but there's no way to eliminate it without physically sanding it off. And in most cases, mm -hmm. that that is not going to be the case. Maybe the vibration type mm -hmm. uh, table could would remove that as well. Maybe worth a try, uh, but it's not something I've tried. Where can you purchase vinyl mask? Um, I don't really buy vinyl, but you say you do, Keith. Where, uh, where do you buy yours? Uh, there's a, there are dozens of, of companies that sell uh, production vinyl. Um, I can't I can't recall the, the company I've been using. I, I order large amounts and and keep it in inventory, and mm -hmm. so I only order vinyl about once every two years, unless unless a customer has a very unique color. Uh, and I have a vinyl cutter uh, in my yeah. shop office here, but I, I basically I only use it for s cutting sandblast masks uh, out of vinyl. That's the only time I, I don't really do vinyl sign work. Oh, no worries. No worries. But mm -hmm. um, I, I've come across it a lot. JDS, I know, sells it. Uh, most of your sign supply shops that I buy my transfer tapes will also sell it. So just uh, go into Google and type sign supply. Um, and usually they're mm -hmm. going to carry your Avery and your 3M products, which include just about every color. Uh, I don't have a specific recommendation because since lasers are not vinyl friendly usually. So, um, yeah, but sign supply uh, warehouses and shops is where I would recommend. 
what is the best CNC machine to get on a start in conjunction with a laser? Uh, this is a great one for you, Keith. Uh, that's a difficult question. We talk about that on Sawmill Creek. Uh, almost every week somebody asks about what's the best CNC machine to buy. Uh, there are so many parameters to consider. Uh, you know, obviously your, your, your budget is a big piece of, of the, of the, of the uh, question. Um, if you're going to use it as a hobby machine or you're going to use it for a production commercial work, uh, dictates, you know, basically whether you go to the lower end or the higher end. I like the Cam Master machines uh, and ShopBot. Uh, they're 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 affordable, um, but they're they're commercial quality machines. You can run a ShopBot machine all day long. Uh, you can also run a um, excuse me. You can also run a uh, a Cam Master machine all day long. Uh, you know, they're they're capable. Uh, some of the smaller machines uh, that people talk about these days that are available for two, three, four, five hundred dollars. There, a lot of guys uh, buy those machines uh, to get started and learn, and they quickly uh, step up to the next next machine. You know, the saying is, "Buy your second machine first and save yourself some money." <laughs> so, uh, but you know, the the Cam Master machines are welded frames. Uh, really, really heavy uh, bridges uh, made from heavy uh, aluminum. Uh, really good engineering design. Uh, I've, I've got I've got a Cam Master uh, Stinger two here. Uh, good reliable machine. I and I also I have the the rotary lathe on mine as well. But it will run all day long and cut Corian. Uh, you know for commercial jobs. Uh, a little more expensive, no question. But uh, that you you'll, you're going to you're going to have to do a lot of research to to find your best fit. It's not it's not a question any individual can answer for you. You're going to have to uh, find out for yourself. All right. Well, thank you. How long and how many passes did the samurai uh, samurai relief take? Um, in that case, as I did three passes on that with an 80 watt laser system at 100% power and 20% speed. Um, I cut it first, and, and a lot of times when I'm going to cut through something, I'm going to do a relief. I will cut it first before I, I in, uh, engrave it away. This way you get mo a, a smoother blend from the 3D effect into it. And so, yeah, that took three passes. It was about 35 minutes of engraving for that. Um, and it's about uh, four inches by six inches in size. So. Any suggestions on how to register uh, uh, register material to cut file on a CNC and hog out uh, a laser for detail? Oh, that's a, that's a tricky tricky one. If you're doing the re registration from CNC to laser, I would suggest fixturing, consistent fixturing um, that that can match on both machines. Um, have you done registration at all from in, uh, from hogging out CNC and then sticking Absolutely. it into laser? Yeah, yeah so I, I use the zero zero. I use the zero zero location on my CNC. So I, I slide it right in that corner. That corner is perfectly accurate every time. And then I use the, the, the upper left-hand corner in job control, make sure to slide it up there. It, the, the registration is perfect every time. Uh, even even uh, precise inlays work extremely well. As long as your rulers on your laser are set to zero, zero properly. I would exactly. say if you're not sure or if there is any inconsistency, um, stick a piece of tape onto your table and then use the laser to cut the tape out to that shape and then stick your product on that because the laser is cutting a, a perfect template. So you can place a piece of transfer tape right onto the table, cut it out and then peel it up. So the laser is literally giving you a, a, a template, if you will, that cost mm -hmm. you one cent. Peel it up and then stick your product in, um, especially if you're not sure because rulers... Uh, can be tricky sometimes people bump big things into them and they can start to come off a little bit and need to be adjusted so if you're not sure about that i would suggest a template a fixture or stick a piece of tape down use a laser to cut the shape stick it over the top of that or a piece of cardboard or something like that um, i have a <clears throat> i have a video on our youtube tech usa youtube channel on how to create fixtures and orientation and, and locations and stuff like that you may watch that to kind of see how to do that too All right. It looks like that is it. Keith, thank you so much for joining me today. I thank you everyone for watching.
Um, if you have any questions, feel free to continue asking them. We'll be continuing continuing to monitor any posts from now on. Um, Keith, thanks again, and uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you very much.